வணக்கம் ஃப்ரம் த இணையத்தி நைட் டீம் டுடே வி ஹாவ் அ வெரி இன்ட்ரெஸ்டிங் அண்ட் சாண்டிக் டாக் எக்ஸ்ப்ளோரிங் திஸ் கல்ச்சுரல் ஹெரிட்டேஜ் ஆஃப் இண்டியா டு செலிப்ரேட் த வேரியஸ் ஃபார்ம்ஸ் ஆஃப் சக்தி எக்ஸ்ப்ளோரிங் த எவல்யூஷன் அண்ட் ரிலிஜியஸ் வேரியேஷன் இன் தி ஆர்ட் ஃபார்ம்ஸ் இன் இண்டியா அண்ட் சவுத் ஈஸ்ட் ஏஷியா வி ஹாவ் வித் ஆஸ் டுடே மிஸ்டர் எஸ் விஜயகுமார் author of idol thief and founder of poetry in stone in india pride project iconography based on scriptures on cultural traditions its significance varies with religion period and denomination of its followers concept of duality light and darkness has impressed mankind from its origins joy and happiness with the gloom and fear so we have our gods and goddesses in benign and malign forms vidya shanti lust anger greed egoism pride all her forms are around us without further ado let me welcome mr yes vijay kumar for a further enthralling discussion on the iconography of the goddess celebrating her thank you vijay okay. thank you inayathanai thank you gomanthi thank you sridhar and all friends who have uh, turned up despite uh, the ipl and the us results i don't know you're celebrating or uh, sulking uh, i think it's time uh, that uh, we try to understand today the session is going to be uh, uh, like a eye opener for me this was uh, thanks to sridhar he just asked me to do a, a small introduction and i started doing it in a small introduction and then i realized that uh, there is so much that i had learned uh, and thanks to all my wonderful friends on uh, social media i thought i'll use this to celebrate the wonderful contributors uh, even though they might not know they're contributing to our effort as i told you our project basically documents temple art both in situ and stolen so today you're going to see most of the in situ stuff though i will try to add a little bit of the stolen stuff uh, habits old habits that i had so i'm going to uh, just try uh, sharing my screen uh, so we're going to be celebrating her and uh, it's going to be a, a, a slightly lengthy session as usual so apologies for anybody who wants to take a early uh, sunday night or uh, i'm going to just document uh, what i have learned so if there are any errors uh, the errors are purely mine i've learned a lot from the experts scholars and friends before me and i hope uh, this will inspire people uh, to continue to understand the art and iconography behind this wonderful form uh, before that uh, i wanted to uh, put my credits for people who are looking about uh, the very very basic stories about maisha sudamardhani durga i'm not going to do any sanskrit shlokas i'm not going to recite any uh, sl- uh, songs in this session nor i'm going to tell you the story of my shastra mardini because i myself learnt it from amachitra kada so if you want to know about the devi go by the amachitra kada for starters and then graduate on to the more serious books i would say that uh, please buy uh, such books uh, and uh, give it to the next generation as a startup point so i'm not trying to pitch for amachitra kala but um, the little that i learned uh, the i started off by this amazing small uh, uh, book so i want to thank amachitra kala for spurring us on uh, with these now why uh, should we talk about mother goddess worship i know uh, mr vairam did a wonderful session a couple of weeks ago about uh, really going back but then our own our own land uh, has a lot of these puzzles which have not yet been studied a disclaimer there the graffiti there has my initials is not done by me somebody has uh, scribbled on on this this unfortunately uh, we see such uh, mother goddess worship stones very rarely in south india and uh, this is one of the two that are currently uh, documented there are a few of course uh, in southern india but a lot of people are not even aware of what this stands for and the connect uh, it is so i wanted to start off see it will be a surprise yes uh, it's a little more add on after the ones uh, the preview that you saw last week so i just thought i'll surprise you a bit with these as well so what you're seeing is actually very old how old uh, is is this culture 
unstudied, undocumented, and worshipped. This is another example. For some obvious reasons, uh, for some places where there is movable heritage, I am going to not describe the locations for obvious reasons for safety's sake. But these have been well documented. Uh, we see these around Tiruvannamalai. And I thank uh, for these, uh, Mr. Arun Kumar Pankaj and uh, Mr. A.T. Mohan for these images. You can actually see that they are continued to worship. They are continuously being worshipped. And at some point, we have lost the understanding of what these are. And that, to me, is, is, a, is a gross insult uh, to our ancients. So let's see what this form is and what is the connect. What is this exactly? This is found all over the Gangetic Plain. And it's an, it's a, this is actually a similar sculpture in bronze. And these are some of the earliest bronze deities that we have seen after, of course, Indus Valley. And these go back 2,800 to 2,500 before Common Era. And these are not very rare specimens. In fact, as I told you, this one was uh, put up for auction by noted art thief now who's pending behind by Subhash Kapoor. And these were what were seized from his place. So these are currently uh, sold openly in the market. And these are, as on date, 4,500 years old, fashioned uh, out of our ancestors as a form of mother goddess worship. And these are huge. Uh, these are about uh, three feet to four feet sometimes in height in terms of the bronze ones. In terms of stone, these are almost 10 feet in height, eight, eight to 10 feet in height. And these are some of the earliest uh, mother goddess worship forms that uh, we see. So having said that, uh, I just want to introduce the art of sculpting uh, for, again, this is like a dummies guide. So the experts who are on this panel, please excuse. Uh, this is just going to show you a very simplistic view of addition and deletion in uh, how do you create a form. And what you are seeing is actually Play-Doh. So this is how you make a line using Play-Doh. So here, what you're doing basically is adding material to create a figure. So this is exactly the reverse of what sculpting is. And thanks to a, a very important artist uh, who put these images, I shared these last week, uh, artist from the artist page, Yangi. This actually shows us how an artist envisages a three-dimensional sculpting project on stone. So obviously he is uh, drawn a rough crude sketch and then he starts to reduce the stone. So for people to understand what sculpting and the level of difficulty and skill involved, uh, this is how you start sculpting into a, a hard rock. So of course we will see much greater examples, but I just wanted to show these, how slowly you start removing the rock to fashion out what you had initially sculpted. So the important thing that you have to realize now is the lines are gone, the guiding lines are all gone. So basically you have to leave out the, the, the like the nose would be the last point that you leave out. Whereas when you do uh, uh, Play-Doh, that will be the last one you add on. So this is the level of difficulty, a small chip or a cut, is going to damage. Uh, so slowly you reduce, uh, you start reducing the sculpture to arrive at the final image, which is uh, beautifully done here. But then uh, we are ignoring one crucial aspect in this. So from here, you have come to uh, uh, a three-dimensional image of a, a baby lion, a beautiful work. But then uh, to enable this, uh, just this line art, it's not simple. What you're seeing is not a very uh, normal sketch. What is required to come up to this level of uh, perfect perfection? I know uh, there are doctors on board this session. The human anatomy and understanding the human anatomy, we will touch the subject when we go uh, more into this. So just a leg, just a tail, the amount of knowledge the artist has to have about postures, forms is something mind blowing. I just wanted to start off with that. My favorite sculpture and my uh, greatest introduction to Devi, and now we are getting into the core of this presentation, is what you see here. A lot of people might not recognize where this is from. This is a British era uh, picture of Mahabliburam. In Mahabliburam, there were uh, very ancient, giant Satamatrika statues, of which one of them is my personal favorite. I tried to get a good photograph, but unfortunately, I was stopped. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, we'll talk about them later. 
So this is a, a, a very early sculpture. We will try to date sculptures when we get closer to it. And this is almost a six feet uh, sculpture. And then towards the end of the session, we are going to see how that form has become this form. And the time period between these two, uh, pardon, uh, the, uh, they got the, the name right, but obviously it's not kept in great shape. Uh, and from then on, we're going to see some amazing works across India. So this was actually envisioned as a, a virtual guru. Uh, in the sense that we plan to do this uh, on uh, the last day of uh, Vijayadasami. And uh, basically, I wanted to show Devi across India as a virtual guru. And uh, to me, from that form, uh, which you saw of the mother goddess worship, uh, this is, of course, from the world famous site of Anikivav uh, from the 11th century. Uh, amazing construction by Udaymati, uh, daughter of uh, the Saurashtra uh, king and the queen of the Solanki dynasty. I know some of these dynasties we're not even aware. Uh, that is another subject. Before we go into uh, the art and iconography, I had done a small uh, session on bronzes. I'm just going to cull a few slides from there to show you some very basics. Uh, just bear with me. So we're just going to see what basic posture, standing and sitting postures are there. So when we talk about sculptures, we know what they are. So it's very easy. Just count the bends. Uh, it's, it's very simplistic. So I've just put a plumb line across the center. So that is your basic plumb line. And then we start counting the bends. So the first one has no bends. The second one has one. Third, so third, three. So, so basically, this is what is the bends. So let's look at the bends. So this is just one bend. This is the second bend. And then the face goes the other side. So we actually look at it. The the leg is uh, going to one side, the torso turns to the other side, head turns to the other side. So what are these? So basically, this is one, two, three bends. And this is called, uh, in English, contraposta. And uh, in the Silpa Sastras, we call it Samabanga, Abanga, Adibanga, and Tribanga. Tribanga is most commonly uh, used. Uh, but then you see a lot of sculptures in uh, Samabanga as well. Just keep this in mind. Uh, no great shape. Next time you see a sculpture, just try to count the number of bends. We'll also see a couple of seated asana, seated postures. Uh, some of them are too detailed. So I'm just going to run through them. Most of what you will see will be in Sukhasana or you would be in Utkuriyasana. So we'll just see these. Basically, different styles uh, differ in which leg is down, how casual the postures are. So these are later reference. You can refer to them later. There are some more which are very specific. For example, Garudasana is very specific to Garuda. Yogasana, you can actually see. Immediately, you'll think it is Ayappa, but you will see Narshama in this pose as well. A lot of other image gods are seen in the Yoga Patta. So basically, the Yoga Patta comes around the legs, so that becomes Yogasana. Now, coming to the goddess, uh, a lot of people uh, talk about the attributes of the goddess. You talk about the chakra, trident, arrow, sword, uh, the hand mudra. One hand is holding the demon, one hand holding the shield, the bow. And then you go into the details, what she holds. She holds the trishula, ketaka, arrow, chakra, kat, kaja, akshamala, danu, anushka. So a lot of stuff. But it's all important. Uh, if you go and talk about the legends, each of these has a significance. So imagine, uh, I know you all, uh, as I said, all of you know about this incredible demon. He's got superpowers. And he, in out of his arrogance, you can call him an MCP. He thinks he cannot be defeated by a uh, woman. So basically, the only the Trojan horse, for example, in his boon. So basically, he gets a boon that he cannot be killed by anyone other than a lady. Poor guy, you know, I think he doesn't know the ladies of the world. Obviously, all the gents are sending the lady to battle. So they're not going to send her, send her just like that, right? Obviously, she's apple of their eyes. So they're going to give her something special. So each one of them, uh, so imagine you're sending your daughter to school or exam. So the grandfather gives a pen. Obviously, the father gives something else. So imagine like that. Each of the guards start giving up. So Shiva takes a trident. He pulls it so out of his own trident and gives it to her. Uh, Vishnu gives a discus, Varuna her conch, Agni her spear, Vayu gives a bow, Indra uh, thunderbolt, 
uh, and then uh, Ira, the bell from Ira Vata. So all of these are replicated. So basically, they didn't give what they had. They pulled out. So ideologically, you can say the energy from it was duplicated, and they gave her uh, whatever it was. So each of these gods. So when you read this, you know each god's attribute as well. Yama has a staff. Varuna gives the news. The Brahma uh, gives a string of beads and water part. Poor god, you know what else can he give? So he gives his Akshamala and this water part. Surya's own ray. So so basically, she radiates with Surya's. Uh, Kala gives her sword and a spotless shield. The ocean gives her ornaments and garments. Vishwakarma, the, the traditional architect, makes a brilliant axe. You know, imagine like Thor's uh, hammer. Uh, she's got this uh, brilliant axe, uh, various hammers, an unbreakable armor. And then, very importantly, the ocean gives her an unfading lotus two garden, particularly uh, uh, lotus garlands. One she wears across, and then one she's said to be carrying above her head, which is very unclear. Uh, and then Himavan gives her uh, gems and uh, this lion. So we'll talk about this interesting lion because this lion has a name. And uh, Kubera, of course, gives her a drinking cup of celestial wine. So these are the sum of these attributes. So obviously, two hands are not going to be enough. So you will see her uh, emerging two hands, eight hands, six hands, 12 hands, 10 hands, 18 hands, whatnot. So all of these are depicted in art. So now, uh, I don't know if Mondipa is online, uh, a, a great amount of gratitude to her blog post. In fact, uh, this was what started me on this quest. Uh, she basically uh, helped us uh, see a lot of these uh, very early images. Uh, she had put it up. Uh, the link is unfortunately jumbled up. So maybe I will put it in later. So this is actually a first century common era uh, depiction of Maisha Aslam uh, Most of these are early terracottas and ivories that you will see. Uh, not really bulk of it in stone. This is from Rajasthan. And you can actually, when you go closer, you can actually see the lion there. And then you go up, you see her holding the, uh, the nose, the snout of the buffalo demon. So this is one of the earliest depictions. Of course, uh, there are other depictions of the goddess. But today we're going to focus on uh, the episode connected to Mahishasura uh, and the ones, uh, events preceding it. There are a couple of others. Uh, for example, this one is a cushion period, uh, second century artifact, uh, common era from Mathura. And uh, this uh, is uh, another. So actually, I think I have a color photo. So this, this kind of uh, images, uh, each of these stones are different. Uh, so people who are willing to uh, study these, the stone itself is a clue to the location. So this is from Mathura. Uh, this is a second century Koshan era a depiction of the goddess uh, currently in the Lakma. And what you, you can see is this pink mottled stone is actually uh, very, very clearly uh, uh, indication. So whenever you see this coloration of stone, it's from central India, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Uttar Pradesh, that border, the Kushan dynasty. Uh, amazing creation currently uh, she in the uh, Ashmolean Oxford, uh, in, purchased in 2005, uh, I think. Uh, no other details we know of. Uh, again, uh, slightly later, uh, second, third century common era. Uh, we're going to see a very rare uh, paper. So people who are interested in it, please refer this paper by uh, J.C. Harley, uh, which talks about uh, the uh, element which I spoke to you about, the second garland. See, she wears one garland and she's supposed to be carrying another garland above her head. Is it a garland? Is it a, 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 a bowl of uh, flowers? It's not clear. So what she holds up in her head. So this paper is a very interesting paper, but it's too advanced for us. So I'm just going to skip that. This is the line that we talked about. The, the line of the goddess, his name uh, was Nana. So Nana was a, a god by himself. Uh, and uh, he was actually uh, depicted in Kanishkan era coins. Uh, and uh, he's actually called Narnia. So maybe no connections to the Narnia. But then uh, he did have a name. Uh, he celebrated in the coinage as a god in his own right. So you can actually see it, Nanaira. So that's the name that's on the coinage. And uh, he then graduates to becoming the uh, vehicle of the goddess. Then let's pass quickly a few more centuries. Uh, we come down into Udaigiri, uh, a fantastic site, uh, better known for the colossal Varaha, which again is another topic. See, we should do one on Varaha similar to this. This is from Udaigiri cave number six, uh, roughly dated to 402 or 401 common era. So 1,600 years ago. And this is indeed a brilliant depiction 
of Akira, she's actually dragging uh, Maisha by the leg and then spearing him. And you can actually see the brilliant horns uh, on her feet. So she has the leg firmly clamped on the head of Maisha. And here again, we see this interesting depiction. What is she holding above her head? So is it a, a basket of uh, flowers or is it a, a, a lotus garland? This is something that has uh, still uh, baffled experts. Uh, uh, the Guptas uh, were amazing. So from, for me and our friends, we would drive 500 kilometers to see a single Gupta sculpture. So this is again uh, from uh, Udaigiri, uh, which we saw uh, amazing, uh, slightly later version that you are seeing is about 5th century. And you can see the comparison here. So obviously, uh, different acts, uh, sculptors chose different uh, episodes to depict. So here you have him being caught by the tail. Uh, so you can actually see uh, him catching her by the tail. Uh, then uh, the head of Maisha is depicted there. Very beautiful depictions. Uh, we'll see another one uh, uh, shortly about how it is. Uh, how sorry, let's flick off the highlight. It's leaving now. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Devgar. Uh, this is uh, an amazing. Uh, Beautiful location. Uh, I wish people would travel uh, more into central India. Uh, this is called Rajkart, uh, where basically uh, this is on a uh, elevated, uh, like a small hillock, and the river Betwa is actually cut into the rock. And, and it's 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 actually a, a bit of a steep. Uh, I wish I've actually told the tourism department to put at least a rope uh, because it is really risky as you descend during summer. It's it's a very steep uh, descent, and around those walls in the bathing carts, you have these deep, beautiful depiction. And let me see. I think I have a better photograph in the next slide. Yeah, there uh, here you actually see uh, the brilliant ornamentation. And here you're talking uh, about. Uh, 1,500 years ago, the way it is depicted. And then you can actually see, uh, you know, that the buffalo is, the demon is actually dying. Uh, so it's a wonderful depiction. Again, these are bar reliefs carved onto the mountain that has been cut uh, by uh, 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 by the river. Uh, it's an amazing sight. Uh, so I wish uh, you guys go down there. I think I have another picture uh, uh, maybe uh, this picture is from uh, our face. So I forgot. I supposed to credit people. This is from a Facebook friend, Mr. Prakash Mandreka. So we've done that and still we uh, gradually go further down and we are now going to go uh, to... Uh... So fans of uh, Sivagami in Sabadam would uh, need to wake up and see this uh, place. So this is... Uh, the setting of Sevagami in Sabadam. This is uh, Vatapi or Badami. And this is a fantastic site. Actually, what you're looking at is uh, this is uh, where uh, this is actually like a U-shaped and inside which is this lake and the town is here. So imagine the Pallava armies would have come in through this and fought uh, Pulikesi out of here. Somewhere around this wall is the, uh, the pillar inscription where... Uh, Mahindra Palla, uh, sorry, Mamala uh, celebrates or says that he uh, burned down Watapi. Now, why am I spending so much time here? So when you go closer into this, and uh, this is where you, you see the caves. So this is cave number one. And then as you go up, uh, you will see the different caves. And all these are stunning caves. Uh, this is a very, very important site because you can see the entire evolution of temple architecture from caves all the way to structural temples in one shot. Uh, so I, I would really like people to visit uh, Badami. And that's cave num the, the first cave. And why we are here is again uh, the eye hole. Uh, the next, before we go to eye hole, this is the cave that we need to see. I don't know why it's uh, got cut off. Let's see. Ah. This is the beautiful uh, Maisha Suramardini that is there in the Barami cave. And here again, you can actually see her uh, uh, early form. Uh, this is inside the, uh, uh, rock cut excavation. And you can actually see the muscularity of the Devi. And this is very characteristic of early, ch early Chalukyan art. Uh, so when you're looking at... Uh, uh, you're talking uh, around the 5th, 6th centuries, very busty, and uh, you can actually see her, actually she speared uh, Maisha. 
Victor, this is a wonderful session by itself. It will take another few hours to just talk about the beauty of uh, Badami. So I'm going to skip again because the focus is Tamil Nadu here. So we are going to go into uh, another cave uh, that is Aihole. Uh, again, Aihole has got a beautiful Jain cave, which I'm not talking about right now. This is the Ravanapadi cave uh, dated to the 6th century common era. And you see a beautiful depiction uh, in a cave. So imagine uh, when you go inside the cave, uh, there's a shivaling, there is a Atamandapa, Mohamandapa, and a Sanctum. And on both the sides, you people have seen the dancing Shiva. He's on this side, and uh, the Devi is on, on here. And you can actually see her, uh, how she's actually twisted the head of my Maisha. So she's actually twisted the head of Maisha, and she's holding Maisha by the tail. Amazing depiction, uh, brilliant sculpture. This is about six feet into the mother rock. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a stunning depiction. And then... About a hundred years pass, uh, and then we are going to see uh, the structural temple in Ayol, the Durga temple. And there, uh, we are going to see uh, this. Uh, again, this is uh, thanks to a wonderful contributor. And as you walk around, uh, so so when you look at the Durga temple, there are sculptures on the pillared walls as well. And the inside sanctum, you have Kosha sculpture. So the Durga is inside the inside sanctum, and a stunning depiction of her. And here again, you see the same style of the head being twisted and uh, the line comes in and there she is. Uh, so she's very, very different form. And you can see the multiple hands. The now remember, so the bell is from Airavata, the conch, the discus, uh, the trishul. So and then she's wearing this uh, beautiful garland. So you can actually see uh, all that that we've uh, seen for. So within a scale, uh, let's say, let's compare the two together. So within a scale of 100 years, you can see the form getting more refined. Uh, so so this is from uh, the Ravanapadi cave, and this is uh, inside the structural temple. So the structural temple allows a lot more freedom uh, because you can actually uh, take a lot more risk. So this is actually a coastal sculpture. So this has been sculpted somewhere and bought and kept it. Whereas the other one is in situ. So you have to work within a certain confines. Now, there was one particular thing that I missed in the earlier one. So let me see if I can show you that. Yeah, this one. So we're now moving closer to Tamil Nadu. Uh, this is again from the same paper. On the right side, uh, this is uh, identified uh, as a Pallava Kanchi that is uh, from Kanchipuram, uh, Pallava dynasty of Mahisha. Suramardini, that is supposed to be the National Museum. Unfortunately, I have not been able to track a better picture. But again, she's holding something up on the head. So this is actually Durga. She's actually put a knee on uh, Maisha and uh, she's pushing him down. So this is a very rare depiction uh, of an early Pallava uh, sculpture that is uh, currently in the National Museum. So we are now going into the main portion. So we have seen a rough depiction. I have not even covered 10% of the states. We have not gone to the, the north yet. So for want of time, we are going to go into Tamil Nadu. So I felt it very important that these early forms have to be properly documented because most of them are out in the open. Uh, this is a beautiful depiction from... Um, so you can actually see uh, from what we have seen before, these are not dated. They have not been studied. This is in low relief, very, very low. So, so this again, uh, so for the readers who've just uh, seen the first portion, you can really spot it is Samabanga. There is no flexion. There are no bends. So these two forms are uh, basically early depictions of her. And they are forms of Maisha Sramadhani because you can actually see the horns of the Maisha there in both the depictions. Now, some of the pointers here are very interesting. And again, for people who have attended the bronze session, or uh, if you want, you can look up on YouTube. Uh, the arms, it's very, very important uh, stylistically for us when we talk about iconography. For early people and now, stone cannot be dated. Stone cannot be radiocarbon dated. It can only be stylistically dated. So studying forms is very important for us. And this uh, amazing uh, contribution by Balaji KS, uh, again, our Facebook friend, actually shows us a very important uh, way in which early Pallava sculptures, the hands actually are shown as though they're coming out of the elbow. So they don't come out of the shoulders. So normally in a later sculpture, you will actually see the hands going out from here. But 
here quite weirdly they seem to be as though they've been grafted at the uh, elbows so this again you can actually see a, a, a crude depiction of a deer which is one of avana and the devotee engaged in ritualistic self sacrifice and avakandam as we call it so basically this is a devotee who is actually giving his head so basically he's holding his uh, uh, what do you call it sri kudumi kena solla tam angle okay a tuff of hair and he's going to cut off uh, his head top so knot. this depiction you know, top knot uh, whatever so so as we come to uh, this again i'm going to uh, call a piece of the lesson on uh, bronze dating uh, so just uh, quickly let's see what this hand uh, is important so here you actually see a uh, 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 short uh, slides uh, some slides on how uh, we use uh, where the elbows are joined so here you see in the bronze the the hands are actually coming and they're separating only at the elbows so as we grow guru uh, sri desikan uh, so what we are going to see uh, i'm not going to spend much time on this because this is not the subject but these are the earliest uh, known uh, uh, palava period bronzes uh, this is the vishnu uh, so we are going to see uh, these vishnus are currently uh, in uh, in the madras uh, in the tanjore museum and this is uh, in the madras museum so now uh, if you look at the hands you can actually see the hands are actually fused till the elbow and then they split out now you can let's see uh, if you can find this is another vishnu that is in the metropolitan museum uh, i see i have a better version so you can actually see when you see from the side it is very clear you don't see two hands at all it's actually only uh, a depiction of so the hand actually sprouts out from the elbow and this is one of the vital clues that we used to date early pallava sculpture so having said that i'm just going to crudely show you the differences and then later on you can actually see uh, this is a 13th century uh, uh, bronze vishnu that is in the lakma you can actually see the hand uh, starts to split off right at the shoulder so they so let me see if i can show you the difference so so here you can actually see uh, the fuse till the elbows and then the elbows uh, the, the hand is actually different uh, other side itself so you can actually see two hands here so this is the later chola uh, version where the hand splits at the shoulders and the earlier ones uh, so so let's see if we can table all of them together so here here goes so you can actually see how the hands are changing so you have a spread of about 700 years on how iconography has evolved so these are different forms so having said that now uh, so that's a, a very important clue uh, this is again from ravi kp and balaji krishnamurthy again friends from facebook so a lot of these are scattered around tamil nadu in villages and very very interesting depictions i think i have a better uh, photograph uh, the next slide yeah here again you can see a very wonderful depiction uh, before we go into the bottom you can actually see the hands are sprouting off at the elbows again so this is a, a fifth sixth century uh, it's, it's just a guideline which says it's pre sixth century for example very busty uh, in the sense that uh, uh, very uh, she is really muscular not the very graceful uh, sinuous limbs that we will see when the uh, pallava uh, appeared uh, goes on here again you see a devotee that is engaged uh, so he's actually cutting off his head uh, on on the side uh, you can actually see him so uh, i don't want you to judge whether you can say whether it's right or wrong let's not judge history by uh, today's lenses this was the belief then uh, again uh, thanks to balaji krishna murthy we have these two beautiful depictions so let's see if you can spot uh, the differences that are happening in style so this is a slightly later depiction as as you can see uh, the form is getting more refined the devotees are getting more refined compared to this form which is in slightly low relief so low relief a uh, deeper relief uh, we get to see a lot of these uh, still under worship as grama devatas and uh, i i uh, uh, tons of respect to to the village guardians who uh, basically worship them Uh, this is another imp- interesting slab relief uh, thanks to ramesh mutra mutayan uh, and uh, these are two depictions that uh, you have to see uh, 
amazing depiction. Uh, you can actually, uh, let's go closer. So you get the entire uh, arms. So she's full. Uh, it's like your missile driven aircraft. So she's fully loaded. She's got these, the deer with its antlers. We will see more refinement. And then look at the buffalo. It's like your Chicago Bills logos. And then you've got somebody who's turned around. So this depiction is a very interesting depiction of a devotee who's turned facing the goddess. It's very difficult to depict uh, in, in such a low relief. And it's been very beautifully attempted uh, here, though he's not able to have uh, the required uh, perfection on it. So we've seen a lot of these reliefs. Again, uh, I'm not giving uh, the locations for obvious reasons. This is another submission by uh, Aragoru Venkateson, uh, who's uh, very, very uh, good at uh, running around and finding these uh, lost beauties or uh, uh, no, hidden beauties. I can't say lost. Here again, you can see a slightly advanced version where uh, the devotees are shown kneeling. And we will see this depiction being refined uh, when we go closer to Mahabalipuram. So we are going to eventually go to Mahabalipuram, of course. But then each of these basic uh, tenantment is the same. She, see here, you see her holding a bell, a uh, sword, a uh, long bow starts coming in. So this long bow seems to be a favorite in Pallava, early Pallava period. Uh, which sadly does not come across in the Cholas. Uh, it becomes a normal bow. But when you see early Pallava, then you will see this long bow. Again, uh, this is from Ravi KP. Uh, you can actually see the long bow. It's, it's, this is another sculpture. And then she's got a small dagger uh, in her clip. And then you can see the, uh, the deer here. You can actually see the, the deer with the antlers here. So there are hundreds of these depictions. I'm just going to go running across uh, to show you a few more. Uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, depiction of her, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Raj Pani Selvam. This is, uh, again, uh, a lot of these are still uh, being celebrated as village deities. This is from, uh, as I said, Padma Priya Madam, uh, another ardent uh, traveler and blogger and writer. And this is somebody that you should definitely follow, uh, R.K. Lakshmi. Uh, this is actually from uh, Tirutangal Rocket Cave in Virdhunagar. Very rare depiction uh, on a bar relief uh, to see such a beautiful depiction of these cute ganas riding the Vahana. So here you have Devi. And then you have, uh, so basically you have uh, a cute gana sitting on the elephant, uh, on the line and uh, the Gana riding the antelope, and then you have the two devotees, and then there seem to be two uh, more devotees worshipping on the side. So having said that, uh, we are going to go into uh, Mahabalipuram. Again, some, something that's very close to my hometown and my home. Uh, amazing depictions uh, coming to their pinnacle. So I would say that Mahabalipuram is a high water mark. So whatever you've seen, and then you come to this. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, I want to thank uh, another wonderful contributor, Gyanlugi Grizzoli, an ardent traveler. You please follow him. I think he uh, has seen more sites in India than all of us put together. And he has got this amazing uh, Facebook where he starts uh, uh, sharing information. So back to the form. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that she's lost her uh, upper left hand. So it would have hold uh, the conch. Uh, unfortunately, it's been damaged. Uh, we don't know when it's been damaged. But the goddess is standing in Samabanga. And interestingly, there is no Maisha below. So she's not uh, riding on it. And there are only uh, Ganas. And then there is this devotee who is in, again cutting off his head on one side. Uh, so this is uh, possibly an uh, early depiction. So as we go around uh, to later depictions, I'm not trying to date the caves. Uh, so this is from Draupadi Ratha. But you can see actually the iconographical evolution. So the way you look at the Devi, she's a little more ro round uh, and uh, robust in this. And then we go into the next uh, Varaha Mandava. Again, Krishna Kumar, this is your image. You can actually see her a little more uh, streamlined. And you can actually see a little more grace uh, in the way uh, she is uh, there. So comparing to that, uh, she's a little more slim. And here again is this attempt at showing a devotee partially turned facing the goddess, cutting off his uh, head. 
these are uh, I'll, later i'll show you the amazing uh, work that was involved in these creations when we go into the main mahishasura marjani depiction but what is interesting here on top you have the two vahanas come in so she is not sitting uh, she doesn't have the mahisha head here but uh, the two uh, the antelope and uh, the lion have come there and she holds uh, what is broken you can actually see the outline of the conch in the discus and she's got only and another right hand is broken off so you, you, she is four handed so we uh, see uh, another depiction to me the most beautiful unfortunately the least visited the adivaraha mandapa uh, not the people are not to blame it is the only temple under worship the keys are in the saina permal temple you need to beg borrow cajole the priest or go with him when he goes to open the key when he chooses to do it for 10 minutes he'll open in the dark dingy uh, climate he'll tell you uh, just you have to run along with him but you can see the difference so what you have seen uh, this is from saurav and i'm i'm, I'm going to see you uh, another depiction of a black and white image from another contributor uh, selvam shanmugapriyan but uh, i want you to look at the stylistic evolution from samabanga into tribanga now it's very easy for you to uh, to look at the plumb line you can actually see that this is if you if you just see this is a straight line the first bend the second bend and the head goes the other way so this is classic tribanga with the uh, with the knee uh, bent and uh, let's see if i can oh, superimpose uh, the black and white yeah now you can actually see uh, this is amazing work so so stylistically uh, this would be before and here you see that uh, it's a slightly later depiction and such a beautiful depiction and this is where iconometry and iconography comes together so just that two bends has created has breathed life into this sculpture this looks like somebody posing for a school photograph and this looks like uh, somebody is actually catching the act in action and actually uh, so that's what uh, slight changes in iconometry brings in uh, this is the trimurti cave uh, i would say iconographically later but again she goes back to her samabanga but multiple hands so the rating of this is uh, something that uh, we need to uh, to understand better now we go to the the masterpiece of mahabalipuram a lot of people have uh, seen this and uh, they just walk off uh, the mighty Maya mahishasura mardani uh, relief uh, i have no words to discuss describe this but before we go into looking at this i actually had a chance to look at an artist view uh, of uh, how to appreciate what you see on screen so before we go in to see uh, any sculpture or even ajanta uh, this was a study that this artist did when he went to ajanta so we're going to see uh, some uh, this is from vajra art uh, in facebook you can actually see how uh, an artist has to study the different postures to animate a sculpture and for that he need to know uh, basically the entire anatomy so how he works the bottom up to come up with a life like depiction so each one of these you will see depiction in 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 the sculpture that we are going to see so it's not just showing a hand like this the way uh, in tamil we call it nalinam uh, grace so to get that grace you can always say you no know, real uh, real life but then amazing that they can uh, study this to uh, this extent so then they go down a little bit of art, artistic exaggeration each of these forms basically need a high level of skill so basically it's not just sculpting skill they also need to know the puranas they need to know the stories they need to know iconometry they need to know proportions and they have to study and observe so just a hand uh, uh, a leg uh, that is put this way a leg that is bent a leg that is uh, uh, somebody who is walking somebody who is stopping in a walk all these are required and for that the amount of knowledge and time they would have spent in observing this so even the seated postures the the dancing postures so please take take time to appreciate uh, the effort that the sculptor has put into creating these works even the eye the form of the eye the shape of the eye how they you know the, the lips the the face how it is turned so basically we just think it's straight profile and side profile it's not that each one of these sculptures are turned at infinitesimal uh, angles 
and each of them require a different amount of uh, you know of, of turning the lips slightly up slightly down the eye slightly bent and the emotion it brings out in the final composition is very different again uh, since we're talking about ajanta i just want to show you the artist impression how he is basically try to understand how the expert painters of ajanta managed to build the profile to come up with a realistic depiction it's not just that they drew somebody uh this is another example uh, again it's a very rare sculpture uh, hardly i've seen about four of it this is a very special type of yagnopavita it's called krishna jina that basically is skin of a black buck that is worn as the sacred thread and you can see uh, this is in the vnda uh, but then there are depictions in uh, the uh, bombay museum and one if you go to devga what is interesting is you no know, just look at this trunk the torso you just say yeah, what's the big deal But then when you when you look at how much effort the sculptor uh, has put in to study to come up with this so every bend every flexion every bulge on that has a study behind it and and once you realize uh, what the amount of effort you know that broken torso with no heads no leg no hands you start to look at it with more respect and this is the famous uh, padma pani that is in ajanta again an artist rendition of it so you can actually see a uh, triple flexion so how uh, a man stands in triple flexion how it breathes beauty into the art form but then it's not just bending it you'll have to make it look natural having said that we go and visit uh, the the masterpiece so this small gana there the hand how he is shown the other hand let's see uh, the the multiple hand postures and you actually have to go near and see not one of them would be in the same posture so let's see the another one the other hand you can actually see each of them so how she is holding a bow the bow has to be held straight with with the elbow uh, stiff and how she is holding uh, so so the 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 sculptor spends enormous amount of time uh, analyzing each of these sculptors so this is a very heavy mace that he is holding up so he is actually balancing the heavy mace uh, like this so this kind of specialization uh, how how they managed to do it i don't know so you can see her uh, as i said each of these postures are important here if you look at it she is almost at the stage of defeating him so you can actually see her uh, almost uh, claiming victory uh, it's, it's 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 i'm not trying to draw parallels to today so she is actually claiming victory and uh, maisha sura is uh, acknowledging defeat so you can actually see that from the posture you can actually see her uh, let's see if we can go closer and and see her yeah there you can actually see the head that that slight upturn of the head that says that you know i'm i'm winning and contraproset with with him his uh, his head leg i said is actually looking down so these are subtle things and this is the gana my favorite guy you can actually see him and he's actually having a fly whisk so that's what he has and with that you know so a lot of these uh, flunkies basically so then you have this uh, small gana there again holding a long bow of his size see he is a stunted dwarf the gana is a stunted dwarf so if you look, really look at the hands he is actually studied a, a stunted dwarf the legs are stunted it's not just somebody who is small they have depicted a stunted dwarf and then to show that it's a stunted dwarf he's got this big mustache as well and then you can see her uh, again you can count the weapons you can see who gave it uh, everything is depicted and how she is sitting as straight you know when you sit on a horse you you sit up uh, so i see her she is sitting up up straight on it amazing so the line uh, if you actually go near you can actually see the uh, canine teeth uh, that is actually out of the sculptor and she is my favorite uh, uh, i don't know six pack or eight pack this lady that's on her feet i imagine uh, such a amazing uh, depiction and the, on the right side you actually see a dead body that's been bitten off let's see if i can show you in the next slide so there is this guy who is hanging cut by two and he's falling down and then there is this guy you can actually see him look up sir poila sir you know no we had we had lost can we go away and this guy is almost thinking whether he can go away 
and there is this guy trying to see where can i run off so a lot of these individual uh, that as i said the, the heavy uh, uh, mace being held up amazing work uh, there you can see this guy looking up and you can actually feel that he has lost it uh the running mate uh losing and saying uh, can we give up and run now so you can actually see that despair uh the lost hope in the face and you look at these guys all all about to give up and all of that is shown by the body posture all of them are backing up you can see all of them are actually at posted at an angle that's always tilted away so maisha is like this and all the assistants are away and now having seen all this now you step back and you imagine that this entire composition is carved into a hill the pillars that you see are part of the mother rock and then this is only the side wall the street has uh, the sanctum and then it has got an artha mandapa with these lion pillars all carved into the same mother rock so imagine the amount of uh, artistic detail they should have so just go back to the first slide when that small lion was carved on a piece of rock So imagine what kind of detailing, and and this is not that the other side has a sign <laughs> per mile. So it's not that he just left it on two sides. So all these detailing, what you're seeing, everything has been carved. And then we go to the front. So there it is. This entire rock. So here is Maisha, and here is the sign per mile. And then you have these two more these uh, aborts or these all these sanctums, all of it carved right into the stone. and uh, sadly one of these pillars was or two of these pillars were broken and our jokers basically put up these monstrosities they can't even make what was next to it uh, that's that's how bad it is and then having said this this is, to me is the greatest sculpture but there is a smaller sculpture which is on the entrance of mahabalipuram uh, uh, outside the atrana chanda mandava cave which was actually filled up with sand and then it was excavated later and just in front of it is a small rock you now when you come from other side a lot of people miss it it's called the tiger caves and this actually seems to portray the second step so basically what you see there uh, in the main cave was actually uh, maisha still not losing up this looks like uh, after the results are out so yeah, you can actually see him he is almost on his knees saying i am done leave me and his hand is actually gone the other way around and maisha is actually walking up for her victory speech so so all all the ganas are shown uh, so amazing depiction but then you can actually see each of them so this guy is all you no know, please don't put any more cases on me i i i withdraw so it's it's again an amazing depiction uh, please don't miss it when you go to uh, malai so just compare so act 1 scene 2 later date also they tried to depict this is a very late uh, depiction of adudurai in adudurai uh, of a miniature but then uh, you know uh, i would say that uh, the artist has lost uh, the main so here she is aiming the bow somewhere maisha is somewhere but again uh, you have to keep in mind it's a, a miniature having said that i come to my favorite uh, which i wanted to show you my favorite in this is this very rare uh, depiction in singavaram it's a unknown cave a lot of people don't go it's a sayana permal of it sadly the permal uh, three many all three of them were stolen about 4 years ago right next to him is this beautiful depiction of durga very rare uh, this is a bar relief again you can actually see 400 very stylistic uh, you can actually see her no uh, put one leg up on uh, maisha this devotee is actually cutting off his thigh uh, you can actually see him uh, cutting off his thigh here and then you can see uh, the classic prayaga chakra so this is a early depiction and uh, the tribanga uh, uh, so so you can actually see uh, how this depiction is so straight line one cut two cut the head goes other right so beautiful tribanga again the arms are slightly extended the legs are slightly extended so she is not as busty as the early depictions and then after this period uh, so we're talking 6th 7th century we move on to this amazing depiction this is another depiction that we rarely get to see uh, this is uh, just outside uh, uh, panamalai uh, on when you climb up to panamalai just in front of it you see this beautiful depiction 
ఆఫ్ మహిషాసుర మర్ని లేటర్ పలవ మోస్ట్ లైక్లీ రాజసీమ బికాస్ ద అప్పర్ కేవ్ ఇస్ ఇస్ అప్ప అప్పర్ టెంపుల్ ఇస్ ఇస్ బట్ యూ కెన్ యాక్చువల్లీ సీ హర్ సో ప్రౌడ్ దిస్ ఇస్ వాట్ ఐ క్రో మెత్రీ డస్ టు ద కాన్సెప్ట్ సో షీస్ యాక్చువల్లీ గాట్ హర్ లెగ్ ఆన్ ద లైన్ but the way the hand goes on top of the leg shows that she's done it you know she's she's won the election and then you can actually see all, all the hands uh, that are there and then the way uh, rajasimha lines are his own so this is uh, again a very rare depiction that we get to see carved into a you will hardly miss it it's just like a niche uh, into the rock as you climb up panamalai that you see it then uh, slowly as we get into the uh, uh, chola pallava transition uh there are a lot of these icons this is again uh, thanks to kp ravi uh, in the madras museum as swami i think this is your picture uh, this is uh, from the kanji kailasnatha temple again these are rajasimha period uh, you have to keep in mind that these were brilliantly coated with limestone and painted you can actually if you go near you can actually see some vestiges of the paint and again the stone is actually uh, a very uh, coarse uh, sandstone which rajasimha i think he got tired of the time required to sculpt granite he picked this uh, softer stone and then uh, coated it with limestone and made these beautiful sculptures so we've just about touched uh, 7th century 8th century uh, during the same period uh, the, the influence in uh, south east asia comes up this is a brilliant vishnu durga in anuradhapura that was excavated uh, this is the excavation photos and then we see a uh, uh, depictions change so this is again balaji krishnamurti and arvind's uh, image i just want to show you how this is in samabanga so this we said uh, so uh, or more like a cartoonish lion and an uh, antelope here but then when you see this depiction so so you can see she is uh, really in tribanga more fleshy and busty so the dating of these are uh, again something that uh, needs a lot of work to do uh, we go to another interesting vaishasra madhini with unfortunately uh, this is something that happened Uh, these brilliant sculptures of the 8th century later pallava period were thrown out because the locals were constructing a temple we managed thanks to our friends uh, information get them reinstated so uh, thankfully they are safe except for one murga that was stolen much earlier which is trying to bring back from the us these are uh, i'm just putting up three images uh, from the pallava period so this is the late pallava period so the 8th century images where you actually see her so this is from tachor uh this is from madras museums you can actually see uh, the transition from a low relief to a higher relief and then the bastiness of this and then they become sleeker so some of these are puzzles though this is another puzzle that arvin posted this is from tripuram parindurai so again a very beautiful depiction uh, of uh, devi in prayaga chakra and uh, in tribanga but uh, the leg raised so this i think the it's it's roughly cut out to be the head of mahisha so a lot of these depictions are there uh, that have not been studied uh, so we if you going to look at uh, the same period this is elora elora is another jewel which is uh, most of indians don't know uh, this uh, depiction is uh, you have mahisha actually crawling out after the buffalo has been beheaded Uh, the similar period if you go into uh, thanks to tamil heritage trust and bk srinivasan this is from the baitala temple in bhubaneswar odisha so here you can see stylistic variation so once you get into these so here it's a uh, nara uh, you say the head of a uh, buffalo and the body of uh, of a demon and here you see her so this seems to be the preferred style on the orissan side a lot of these sculptures are depictions of her and how she is actually a uh, pressing down to expose the throat so that she can spear her and this is something that we see uh, in a lot of temples uh, uh, this unfortunately is uh, currently in the philadelphia museum uh, from bobaneshwar uh, again there is one icon that i wanted to talk about this is in patadakkal uh, if you if you visit patadakkal temple on the right side you have this very uh, dark niche uh, that you see this brilliant uh, free standing image of a beautiful uh, mahishasura martin you can actually see her very very stunning depiction but she seems to have been brought in from somewhere my my version is she could not be from there uh, so yeah so we are now passing from uh, the pallava transition to the cholas uh, for some reason uh, where they i feel very close to heart to these 
uh, we are going to see uh, this is the chola emblem this is the first mention of the cholas taking tanjore so in that period the pallava family broke into two or the siblings were fighting together uh, the pandyas uh, favored one uh, one stream the cholas favored another stream and the chola stream won at that time vijayala realized that why should i be a fiduciary again uh, readers of parthiban kanavu uh, this is actually uh, what parthiban uh, again non uh, fiction writers dreams of vijayala installs nisumba sodani in tanjore and takes over tanjore uh, 848 common era so who is this nisumba sodani so so far we have seen uh, only uh, maisha suramardini so before maisha so uh, durga goes to kill maishan uh, there are couple of attendants who get killed nisumban and uh, our two uh, brothers were killed so there is a lot of confusion of who this nisumba sodani is which is actually the devi that was given by uh, so we have one uh, claimant uh, you, <laughs> i know people are saying is this that old this is actually actually the sculpture so our our our, our guys are very creative and also uh, the idea behind it is that uh, she is very very powerful so uh, she is in sandana cup so it cools her down uh, that's that's how you see her but again uh, there are a couple of other depictions now what is interesting here is you can actually see uh, the two demons uh, nisumban uh, below now let's see this depiction this is ekaviri thanks to the french student pondicherry the photograph there is no demons below so she is uh, in tamil called ekaviri and there is another beautiful one that you can see here of ekaviri and what is interesting here is uh, uh, forget the weapons the ear drum uh, what she wears the ear ring so this is a very rare depiction of what is called a preta kundala so basically she is wearing a, a dead body so normally you will uh, see some of these macabers uh, and uh, she basically has a snake as a breast band and a very long elongated face and uh, let's see i think i have a better photograph as well uh, there a beautiful depiction and then she has her upper fangs and so the lips actually uh, are slightly uh, protruding to cover the fangs and a beautiful depiction of her is there i'm searching for another devi which unfortunately i'm not able to track it uh, ukrama kali uh, there again you see uh, she is on one demon below there are a couple of more that have been out of the country uh, this is in the raidberg museum uh, another nisumba sudni and this is uh, something that i wanted to talk about this was something that we discussed uh, for some time and uh, we talked about uh, again uh mr thomas alexander's image so this uh is a very wrathful uh, image so she's actually uh, you know almost putting a tongue out but what is interesting is who is this be- below her so what is this animal it's neither a lion or uh, uh, is neither a, a deer so when we looked at uh, the uh, the what it talks about is Uh, there is a form uh, of devi who goes as a, a, a messenger like krishna goes to the panda the kaurava court uh, she sends one of a messenger she is called shivaduti and she is supposed to have been accompanied by either jackals or hyenas so imagine uh, this uh, if you are a warrior your worst fear would be to be maimed or killed in battle as you are lying down there in the night the kuttu surma kolava surma padathu kadakumbodhu then Uh, the jackals coming and feeding on you as you are lying dying so the 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 howl of a hyena the cry of hyena is something that's supposed to uh, be ultimate so that's her uh, vahana so so she goes and obviously doesn't uh, succeed so this is a very rare, rare depiction of shivadhuti a lot of these uh, depictions are there uh, split across this is a depiction uh, thanks to kalai selvan uh, this is in padai veed Uh, ravichandran kp again uh, amazing uh, depiction all over tamil nadu we have these beautiful depiction again remember uh, we talked about the seating postures uh, i'm not going to keep a quiz you can actually see one leg bent one leg left leg is down so this is a depiction again from manikandan arumugam sir uh, so stunning depictions uh, this is from aragalur uh, this is from kalayar koil so across uh, the belt 
she seems to have become very popular all these are chola icons so what is interesting is the chola men whenever they went for battle they prayed to her so the presiding deity for people going to war the men folk was her and the women folk seem to be uh, praying to bhairava so kshetra balar uh, was uh, worshiped by the royal queens so the queens went to the men to pray the men went to the women to pray so she is uh, uh, and uh, this is these are two of my personal favorites uh, thanks to kumaravel rama swami sir a very wrathful looking deities i cannot stylistically uh, say they are from chola land uh but uh, they carry uh, uh raj raj chola period inscription uh they are called pidari ponna vamarndal uh, so that's the inscription in tamil uh, dated to uh, raj raj so the emperor's date of course 986 to 1014 and this is how they are uh, apparently uh, without uh, of course they are, when you go there you will see her them like this now Uh, this is again uh, all the grama devata so basically these would have been installed most likely by the chieftains or commanders what would the kings have kept so here we are going to the best this is my favorite temple i'm not going to mention the temple name and we were actually photographing her uh, amazing uh, grace you can actually see uh, this uh, devotee cutting off his head high head the, the sword has passed out through a full head of 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 uh, of the buffalo and then you go up and you see her in, and as we were taking this photo the priest came and said wait 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 you can't take photo again i i wish to say all these are fully clothed uh, it's only aidigam but he did this he just did this and amazing from this she became this and then we just put our hands together and prayed and such a beautiful you know just or podai eduth adu chutti vechara avladha the way uh, so that's when we realized uh, that uh the grace of her uh, that she seen uh, you could only pray uh, some beautiful depictions uh, as they move around uh, uh, i would say that uh, the early depictions had the devotees inside the frame inside the coasters and slowly they start going out so there is a, a progression another favorite temple this is in pullamangai uh, i think i have uh, one more snap yeah so this is another beautiful depiction and actually here you see the water buffalo uh, so you can actually see the ribbed horns of her this is again uh, early 10th century uh, period and you can actually go near and see her face amazing grace and uh, multiple arms my favorite temple uh, how can i not talk about uh, cholas and not uh, perigoil uh, this is again a uh, uh, illustration that i did for a talk on the paintings of uh, the big temple but i'm going to use it to show that raj raja did not have a single kosta of durga so what you're going to see is all the kosta devatas all of them are different depictions i've just removed the black ones are the do guardians so if i forget the do guardians all the kostas there is an ardhana rishwara but all the kostas are uh, shiva forms or vishnu forms and then you have uh, surya chandra and then you have saraswati and lakshmi and then if you go into the santara marai you have uh, shiva uh, you have the different forms so you don't get to see uh, vishnu durga or mahishasura mardini but but in the paintings in the famous tripurantaka painting there you can again i'm not going to go into that i'm just going to show you this so this is where as shiva goes to battle the front runner you have kartikeya uh, uh, ganesha and uh, durga leading the charge so there she is uh, in in a beautiful uh, line uh, going and uh, let's see if i have uh, that's ganesha there he is then you have kartikeya uh, all all of them uh, going for battle i think i have a better version let me see uh, this is from uh, madhu's presentation let me see if i can show you that okay so this is where all of them are going to battle there you can see uh, durga so yeah she is depicted but in a painting and then uh, this is uh, from takkolam a uh, takkolam battle is something that uh, ponin selvan fans cannot forget uh, most likely uh, is uh, uh, is a taken over idol so you can actually see the difference so she is in tribanga she is uh, in almost the same posture uh this is from sashidharan thank you uh so is she chola uh because the classic chola is this side is she chola is a question that i leave you with uh 
then uh, we can uh, look at uh, tiruvalanjuli uh, which is another temple that uh, is a very very important temple this is where rajendra does uh, the the first year ceremonies of the departed king in 10 10 14 10 15 so we are now passed from rajaraja to rajendra so rajendra imagine this brilliant he is almost like a warlord king so what does he do so when he captures kings what is ultimate insult that you can do so he he just brought back their war goddess so if you go around gange konda cholabram you get these brilliant war trophies so so he didn't destroy them so imagine you know you you basically bringing back these are huge these are about 12 to 13 feet high multi armed uh, so you can wherever he went so you have rashtrakuta you have chalukya so let's see some of these uh, beautiful examples but before that look at that creation so this is a stunning creation uh, of 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 mahishasana mardani uh, so you have a lot of these durga statues so he had this almost like a fetish again thanks to uh, user contribution i i normally don't use uh, images uh, but, but this is just for size and you can actually see a lot of these are war trophies around about 78 such uh, not i'm just picking the main ones so this is chalukyan uh, this is from uh, this again from paranda mr parandagan this is from kalinga on the right side uh, then you have uh, uh, from anantaram baska Uh, uh contribution this is from uh, mr komagan uh, who is an engineer who any time if you go to gange konda cholaburam what you see of the temple is because of his work amazing work and this is a nolamba uh, era uh, sculpture that was brought back a lot of these uh, basically beautiful sculptures litter around uh, not only gange konda cholaburam but anywhere around that area any of these villages have a lot of these war trophies that were brought back so we now going from rajendra so we've done rajaraja rajendra now we are going to rajaraja 2 which is around 1146 to uh, 1150 uh, so we going to darasuram so he is reign starts from 1150 to 1173 he was co ruler for four years so you can see this brilliant vishnu durga so here you can actually see the aspects are all gone she's uh, seated but to me one of the most graceful depictions of her uh, is is this uh, from darasuram darasuram is a jewel of a temple and she is literally the queen of the temple uh, i also love this depiction in mele kadambur which is from kolotunga 1 uh, 12th century common era that's uh, 1170 to uh, uh, onwards you can actually what is important in this image is not just the durga the, the brilliance of this sculpture uh, again from our friend in facebook is this buffalo head you can actually see it projecting out and that's that's so imposing you have to see it it's almost like a buffalo has been uh, cast uh, to that having said the use the word cast my favorite bronze is a sufer in in uh, the madras museum uh, nisuma sudhani they have named it uh, mahishasura sudha madhani but again you can actually see the preta kundalam so you can actually see her uh, on the left here she actually has a preta kundala she has a nagavandana and then virisadai and brilliant hands and you can see look at her posture so each of these iconometric so this this actually looks like she is spearing so imagine you put a spear in her hand the leg and the torso brings force into her so iconometry iconography is very important compared to let's see if we can compare it with a normal seated posture so normal seated one leg down is this but here you can actually see that the the left leg that's kept like that and the extension of the, of the left leg and the right leg up actually bring fraction into these postures so these are a later chola uh, the last one here is in the red bug museum uh, tons of this is from nellayappar uh, so we can keep going on uh, sirpur uh, so we go pala this is bihar uh, himachal pradesh uh, auction uh, for a million dollars pala Uh, this is from uh, himachal pradesh uh, bajna temple 1204 so 13th century this was stolen in 1964 we was with the metropolitan museum returned two years ago to india in kadamba dynasty uh, very rare to see uh, a surviving uh, mahishasura madani from goa so again we don't know much about these Uh, so then later we we am going into the 13th century they become more artistic this is from the pala sena orissa 
so you can actually see uh, they become more and more artistic uh, it's it's almost like she's smiling uh, uh, depictions are there and uh, i know i have friends from bangalore i'm not done justice to karnataka these are beautiful depictions of the hoysala dynasty uh, uh, again a lot of intricate work that's done uh, i'll take two more minutes sri do we have time we have plenty of time vijay okay so uh, i know uh, this depiction uh, there is always an art uh, minimalism versus uh, extravagance so when you talk about uh, the singavaram durga compared to uh, the hoysala so on one side you have uh, just the beauty of the form and here because of course you are working on softer stone you have a lot of minute details uh, that's been carved into stone so each have their own uh, connoisseur's view yeah so she was not just a doyen of uh, india so for some reason across south east asia there seems to be a fascination for maisha sarmadini form so if, for example if you go to jakarta the national museum in jakarta has about 35 maisha sarmadini sculptures that have been obviously built uh, from uh, bought in from and in a myriad of postures so the black and white one that you're seeing on the right is currently in the mat uh, the next one uh, so this one is in the mat uh, this one i think is in the lakma this uh, so she is uh, from borobudur so from jakarta about an hour's flight is a place called uh, jog jakarta uh, where you have the permanent world famous pramnan temple and she has her own legend let me see if i can remember the legend and this is from a very uh, small museum in uh, surabaya um, but uh, this uh, she is very special uh, let me reply and recount her legend so i don't know if i get this pronunciation wrong she is called lara jongang so she is supposed to have be a princess and uh, a prince of bandung which is another state another country they fought and uh, he actually killed uh, the king king boko and she was a daughter of king boko and he he wanted to marry her the princess tried to reason out and came up with this uh, demand she the prince name was bondo oso i think and she said uh, you build me a thousand temples in one night then i'll marry you see we would have never done even one so we would have run away right but then the prince uh, had supposed to he supposed to have magical powers he summoned jinns uh, you know uh, we have that in tamil also right the bodhangala vand ore ratrila so so they almost managed to finish 999 and apparently the princess was smarter she knew she was going to lose so she didn't go to the judicial courts <laughs> she went to the villages and asked them to start cooking and hearing the uh, hearing the noises and the rice cooking the the village uh, cocks and uh, all started to coo and the dem, the the jinns thought that sunrise had happened and the lights were coming on and they left so it was the task was left half done so 999 temples the princess uh, was refused to marry the prince the prince got so agitated she he cast her to turn into stone and the locals believe that this statue is actually her the princess uh, who transformed into stone so that's the big legend uh, of this beautiful sculpture of maisha sarmadini but then uh, there are earlier depictions this is from uh, the cham dynasty and then uh, from khmer so what you're seeing here is actually from vietnam what you're seeing here is from cambodia so here you can actually see a very cute depiction of the buffalo head in both the places uh, so and uh, what is interesting is if you go up to central vietnam there is a temple called phonagar again say i did this extensive session for hindu temples of vietnam for about an hour and a half and this is a favorite temple because the locals believe that uh, on bhagavadi which i am not sure anywhere out of kerala they even know this name of devi as bhagavadi but here in phonagar which is in nachang which is about halfway between danang and ho chi minh there is this beautiful brick temple where they celebrate the central shrine for bhagavadi and uh, they think the again uh, the very version is the same the queen uh, was supposed to marry a chinese prince not happy she came back and what is interesting is the 9th century some uh, seafaring robbers came and took away the main statue of bhagavadi so this statue robbing was there in vietnam as well 10000s of years ago and the king actually made a statue of gold for her uh, and she is named as bhagavadi 
not only that, uh, my pet fetish, this uh, uh, two bronze, uh, there's a bronze and a stone from Kashmir. We got back the stone sculpture. Uh, this is again looted by Subhash Kapoor. Uh, it was done by the German chancellor. Uh, but this one, we couldn't stop the sale. Uh, she's now gone out of India uh, and from Kashmir. We also have a lot of Nepal to study. Is another 14th century amazing depiction. How do we stop people from looking at them as pieces of art and reducing? So this is actually a Palasena work that is being uh, put up for sale. You actually see the disrespect. As I said, the form shows the nature and how it is looked at. So this is something that we are fighting. We are succeeding. So that's the Tengupura Durga that came back from Kashmir, uh, German Chancellor giving it back to Prime Minister Modi. There's a lot more to study. We've only seen one Devi and her retinue. <laughs> These are an amazing. The study of yoginis and devis is, is a whole subject by itself. This is a, a beautiful yogini from Madhya Pradesh that is in the San Antonio Museum riding an owl. Now, if that is going to surprise you, this is from Lokahari, a ram-headed yogini. And here, this is a, so this was, uh, she was smuggled out by another robber gang of Amangia and caught up in Paris, returned and currently in the National Museum. We are currently searching for this goat-headed uh, yogini, again stolen by the same gang, is missing for the last 20 years. Uh, this is not the end of it. Last week, I was attending another session where I had a rabbit-headed yogini as well from the same side. Unfortunately, she has been uh, broken into two. So India is incredible India. Uh, bronzes, uh, we have uh, you know, the depiction. Uh, as I said, imagine somebody showing with canine teeth and smiling. So this duality only our craftsman can bring. So a fierce form, but then benign smile. And then I wanted to leave you with this lasting image of how we worship the mother goddess. Even though she is fierce, how we look at her is an all-protecting mother. And uh, thanks, Sri and Inetanai, for this excellent uh, opportunity to talk about uh, the forms of the Devi. Hope I have done justice for the session. Thank you. Vijay, thank you very, very, very much. It was an amazing presentation. I have, I have a confession to make. So I've had the privilege of getting a preview of uh, Vijay's talk today because we, as Vijay said already, Inet and I had a special session on uh, the end of Navratri, which was a fortnight ago. And I asked him, can you do an introduction into the iconography of the Devi for about 15, 20 minutes? And what I got was a one hour, 30 minute talk. And actually he's added more than what he sent me earlier. And we felt it, is, it doesn't do justice for all the hard work which has gone in to just leave it as a preview talk. And he kindly has agreed to do this. Thank you, Vijay. I mean, your passion comes through it. And you've just taken us all through a journey of 2000 years of Indians celebrating a mother goddess. Everybody's been just watching, switching their phones and televisions, having kept up with the updates from America and how the new office bearers have roots to India and all those things. And you alluded to that in your presentation as well. But this is just amazing, starting from the Kanishka era and finishing off the Southeast Asian impact of Indian art. For those who don't know, Vijay made three references to a fiction writer, a gentleman called Kalki, who is an iconic Tamil author, historian, inspiration. That is what brought Vijay and me together because we both were fans of his authorship. But it again highlights Kalki and what Vijay has presented, because when people read his stories, we look at the description of the history. We look at the characterization, but there are quite a lot of things which just goes to tell the authors put in his homework. 
Vijay talked about the Navakandam, the catching the top knot or the kudumi and chopping one's own head in offering to the goddess. That apparently was the logo of the suicide squad. Velakara Padai, you could call the special agents, whatever. If they did not protect their king or queen, they will cut their own heads. He talked about Vathapi. He talked about a lot in reference to Kalki. For those who haven't read his work, you have to. And I think he's just offered himself to do the next uh, project. He did mention <laughs> Varaha, but I think rather than Varaha, you should actually look at the whole Dasavatara in Indian iconography with your collection and your friend circle. That will be an amazing presentation in itself, looking at the various forms of Vishnu. Sure, we'll try. There were a few questions and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more. A gentleman's asked, what is the difference in some of the devis having a breastband with a snake and some forms not having them? Well, first of all, uh, the presence of uh, breastband or not is something that has not been properly studied. Uh, but as a layman, roughly when there are two consorts, so you take uh, Vishnu with Sri Devi, Bhu Devi. Bhu Devi does not have a breastband. Sri Devi is always shown, shown with a breastband. Similarly, with Muruga, you will always have uh, Valli without a breastband, Devasena with a breastband. So that kind of defines who wears and who wears not. So all the royalty, uh, so basically among them, one is a commoner, one is basically Indra's daughter. So, so, so normally the common folk don't seem to have when you're talking about royal concerns. As long as the yoginis are concerned, uh, most of them are very fierce forms and they don't seem to have, uh, unless attired by the gods. So whatever they got, were basically uh, what they got from the gods. And the rest, uh, so even, uh, for example, some of them are shown with uh, snakes tied in Sudalangar. So in my uh, reference, I don't see any reference in the text of why she is uh, tied up uh, 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 a snake up as a breast man. Uh, but it is uh, uh, an indicator that uh, most likely of the ferocity of the form. So I have a question for you. And I wasn't aware of this till you mentioned this, that you can't radiocarbon date a stone sculpture. Why? Neither, neither a bronze if it's a uh, solid cast. If it's hollow cast and it's got a wooden core, then you can. So anything that has lived and died can be uh, carbon dated. So the stone cannot be uh, dated because the date will be when the stone was formed, not when the sculpture was sculpted. Similarly, when you uh, do a like solid cast uh, bronze, everything is uh, melted away. So what you get is a metal. So there is no uh, uh, lived or living parts that is there. So both uh, solid cast bronzes and uh, stone uh, sculptures can only be dated stylistically. There are a few studies uh, which are coming up for bronzes to look at the composition of the alloys and looking at markers. You know, for example, the Rosetta Stone, uh, any inscribed uh, bronze. Then you look at the composition of the alloy and then you take it as a place marker. But the problem is they're not cast in a single place. They could be cast in different places where the availability of these trace metals are uh, basically what is available as the ore. Like today, you're not going to order one kg of uh, copper, 200 grams of silver. So obviously, they're going to do with the ores. So in terms of smelting process, in terms of what they added, so it's still an ongoing science to use uh, alloy, uh, the composition of alloys to come up with a possible dating. The second problem is there are so very few inscribed bronzes available. So the markers are also very rare. So both cannot be dated. So you have to rely. And sadly, no two scholars will also agree on the date. Thank you, Vijay. I mean, the most important thing for me in your talk, other than just getting mesmerized by the forms. And you said there are a few doctors in this group. I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon. So I look at bodies see how things are. But the other important thing which you have highlighted, you've already said in your talk, people know smattering of history of South India. 
We never were taught all of those things. And people talk about Gange Konda Chola, Rajendra Chola's Ganga campaign. He defeated so and so. He did that and whatever. But you beautifully showed us by artifacts and the art saying this guy actually went all the way up there. And these were all the kingdoms he went through. He went through the Hoysalya kingdom, the Kalingas, the Nolamba kingdom. And he's brought war trophies to show us he's been there. That was fantastic. That was just amazing. Um, if you look at Rajendra's uh, seals, he actually bought the Vijay Torna when he defeated the Sri Vijayan kingdom. So absolutely. If you look at it, you can actually see. So the entry arch of... So actually in Sangam point, this is... Uh, uh, spoken about. Maybe you can ask Vairam to give you a reference. What they say is the kings in their bedrooms used to have the wooden uh, door uh, gates of the defeated kings to uh, basically show it to their wives. So basically, you know, so that's how uh, vain or rather our kings were. And again, uh, you know how, how the Pandyas and the Cholas fought themselves. So very interesting to know that uh, when uh, the Chola king defeated the Pandyas, he actually uh, broke the throne room. He used a mule, the same was done back when the Pandyas, Sundra Pandya, did it back to the Cholas. So obviously, you know, when you reap such an insult, sometimes it's better to let go. Don't rub it in. So I think Rajendra rubbed it in too much. <laughs> I think there's a question from Bhupati. Bhupati Srinivasan, do you want to unmute yourself, sir? Uh, yeah, hi. It's very amazing because I was just studying about uh, Kotravai, uh, Kotravai worship, uh, as mentioned in the Silapati Gara. And I see some uh, similarities uh, in this description. And also there is uh, um, Artemis in Greek. And there is uh, Kotravai Artemis uh, is there a relation or is it a vague or a loose? Or, uh... See, uh, uh, let me say that I wanted to stay clear of controversies in this section. I just want to celebrate the Indian form. Obviously, there are cross cultural relations. Now, the question is who took from whom is something that I think for a mature audience, I would normally say this and leave it at that. The earliest depictions of uh, megalithic burial sites and uh, in South India, especially in Tamil Nadu, is stone circles. So we call it cane circles. If you go around Pudukota, you will see uh, Mudumakal Thadi, which is basically burial urns. And then around it, heavy rocks being kept in a circle. And this is in the 6th century before Common Era. At that time, the pyramids had stood for 3,000 years. And I would just leave it at that. Cross-cultural influences are there. But unfortunately, not much studies have been done. And uh, for political reasons uh, and otherwise, I think uh, Greek coinage has been found uh, all across Tamil Nadu. In fact, the first gold coin, my limited knowledge, was issued during the time of Raja Rajasola. Before that, we were only using... So, through Adal, I don't know if you've seen the Tamil movie, the Ayram Burkasu would most likely have been uh, Greek coinage because there was no gold coins in Tamil Nadu till about 986. So, yes, there are cross-cultural influences, but then the question is whether it went from here or came from there is something that if we get on, uh, it needs a more mature audience to talk about. That, that was very interesting, Vijay, and a great question, Bhupati. Vijay did allude to Vairam, and he's mentioned it twice. So that's Palaniappan Vairam Sarathi. He, like Vijay, has a lot of passion for Tamil, Tamil art forms, but more looking at it from the cultural perspective of Sangam literature and cross-fertilization between various civilizations. So when I mentioned the Navratri function, we had Vijay talking about the iconography and Vairam actually talking about what you just mentioned, which is celebration of the goddess in the various forms and various cultures. Um, so that, that my, it's on the YouTube channel. So he goes from the Greek, the Persian goddesses and cross influence and all those things. Any other burning questions for Vijay? There are no further questions. Um... But I have to say, there's been lots of comments 
on the chat box, um, particularly uh, from Kamal Raj as well from France. I think everybody so kind of had a wow moment, which I, including myself. We're not intelligent enough to ask so many questions to you in this field. It was more kind of information for us. It was absolutely amazing. It was an excellent presentation, Vijay. Thank you once again. On behalf of everybody from, uh, from the UK as well, from the NITNI team as well, it was truly amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I'm hoping to see many more kind of such occasions with us to share your vast experience and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Jai Hind. Thank you. Celebrating her. What a wonderful you know, title for the, for the moment, I think. Um, Shakti is kind of the primal force that underlies all our existence. It kind of vitalizes and energizes us. So we want to wish you all a very happy Deepavali, a celebration of light and hope for all of us for the following year. I think all of us need that light and hope. Be safe and stay home. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Vanakkam.